But now with all the education stuff that's going on, uh, everyone sees. Dean, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for being with us this afternoon in our September chat. We, um, Dean and I were talking, I think last week about a lot of different things. There's so many good things going on in upstate, but just to even about this um, particular venue that we've been doing, if I had a thought about where we could be six months from now in these chats, um, I'm very pleased at where we are because every week we end up, I, I end up personally learning something else about our 10 county region and the, the speakers have been great and the county updates have always been very impactful for, for me and so I hope for you. Dean and his team have done an excellent job during the course of this pandemic um, to, to keep us together. And today our guest um, presentation is Jim Shu, and Jim is not unfamiliar to us. Um, we've known Jim for a long time and, and the good thing is, is that um, we have him back in our miss. He's the Vice President of Employee Benefits for Marsh and McLean. And um, I, I'm very interested to see, number one, how um, his company can help others in the upstate and how all of this is affecting us, the pandemic and in our different enterprises and uh, whether you're for-profit or not-for-profit business, this is always important. So again, Jim, thanks for joining us today. It's good to see you again. Good to hit, have you back around the tent at the top table, and I'll turn it over to Jim. Jim? Great. Thank you, Sheriff. I'm going to So what I wanted to share today is just information about the financial impact of COVID-19 on employer health plans. And I think that's a topic that I, that will be relevant and hopefully interesting as well. Um, you know, the financial impact of COVID-19, it, it may actually be a bit of a moving target, but hopefully we can discuss some of the key items to consider as we move towards our kind of respective 1-1-2021 um, health plan rules that most employers are uh, probably in the midst of, you know, as we speak. So, let's see if I can advance the slide. And I've, I've practiced advancing the slides with Justine before this started. There we go. Okay. So, kind of to get us started, um, and before we really look at COVID-19 related utilization and financials, I wanted to just bring up this timeline to kind of show and remind us just how rapidly this whole pandemic progressed, you know, I guess kind of, kind of uh, as if we can forget, but it really is amazing just to go back and, and revisit. So it was uh, January 9th of this year that there was the first report of a novel coronavirus out of uh, Wuhan Bay province in China. Uh, January 21st is probably when most of us uh, maybe saw the, uh, the novel coronavirus in the news when the United States uh, reported its first confirmed case and then shortly thereafter formed the task force on January 29th. Uh, but still at that point, I think maybe most of us sort of uh, thought of it as something closely akin to like the SARS uh, outbreak of the early 2000s, really nothing that was going to be, um, you know, an issue for us personally or in the United States. Um, then fast forward two weeks, February 11th, and the World Health Organization names the disease caused by the novel coronavirus COVID-19. Uh, so then we're still sort of business as usual, but we do have a name to uh, what's becoming uh, something that's a little bit more widespread. So from there, uh, if we look less than a month later, there's 100,000 global cases. Uh, exactly a month later from the day on which COVID-19 got its name, the uh, WHO characterizes the outbreak as a pandemic. Two days after that, the United States declares a national state of emergency. Um, pretty much around that same time, businesses begin to shut down. 
within South Carolina, all non-essential businesses are closed as of March 31st. And if you look at that timeline from one to five, uh, from March 7th, April 4th, we went from 100,000 global cases to uh, a million global cases just that quickly. I think what is even more interesting and that a lot of us maybe don't think through, oh, sorry, is uh, the timeline that sort of occurs next. So, uh, you know, mid-April, we're looking at the, uh, the federal government releasing guidelines to open up America in three phases based on infection rates and, um, you know, other uh, metrics that are followed. By May 11th, South Carolina has gone to phase two of the three phases as uh, conditions seem to improve. Most states, I would say, by right around Memorial Day are, are sort of in that phase two stage and beginning to uh, return to some bit of you know, opening up businesses. But then just very quickly, despite you know, what seemed to be some improving trends, you know, if you look at the next two months, by July 23rd, um, we're actually over 4 million nationwide cases, 75 confirmed cases in South Carolina. And then you know, September 1st, I guess I should have September 10th on here with this uh, uh, presentation we wrapped up on September 1st, uh, where you know, nearly 120,000 cases in South Carolina, over 6 million nationwide. So what does that kind of look like? You know, you can sort of see, um, despite some bit of a reopening and a bit of return of businesses and, and working from home and, and Zoom meetings, et cetera, uh, through June and, and July, and you know, the top graph of South Carolina, the bottom graph of the United States, we continue to see this real progression of uh, COVID-19 cases you know, in, in the state and in the country. And that's uh, certainly had some impact um, on what employers experience with their health plan, which is what we're gonna try to maybe dig into uh, a little bit more. So with that timeline as, as background, um, I kind of wanted to first talk about the, how COVID-19 affected healthcare utilization patterns, which I guess in turn, you know, impact employer health plan and, and employer health plans and health insurance. So what we've seen so far is a real kind of reduction in non-emergent services. And despite healthcare reopening, you know, for the most part, we're actually still seeing utilization reductions for non-emergent, non-COVID related services. You know, even though some of those services are certainly available, definitely more administratively burdensome now, uh, if you wanted to have, um, you know, any sort of elective surgery, uh, having to get a COVID-19 test in advance of that, who can go with to the hospital, there's just more that goes into it, which is further, I think, um, delaying care. Also, um, to preserve resources uh, to comply with social distancing requirements, uh, medical facilities initially just didn't offer those services in um, April, May, and uh, you know, as I said, have continued to open up somewhat since then. Uh, we've also seen less routine preventive care, which could result in, you know, I guess the, the, the way it may be seen, but less routine preventative care including dental and vision services, that could actually increase uh, morbidity rates, or meaning how uh, sick people are. Um, so that delayed care might lead to you know, additional costs in the future. Um, and it's sort of as an illustration of that, this is a study that was published actually in June by the Commonwealth Fund, but I think it's very instructive. And it's, it uses data from um, a health data warehouse company, Freesia, uh, they had about 50, or sorry, 50,000 providers and 12 million client records that they used to sort of take a look at what baseline utilization looked like uh, going into the COVID-19 pandemic. And you can see uh, this is ambulatory services. So what I would you know, walk up services, services that would be not emergent um, for the most part, that care dropped off uh, going into March and April uh, and into May. Uh, 60 percent. And we've actually con continued, as I said, even though this graph doesn't show it, continue to see a decline uh, you know, in utilization since then. Um, on the other hand, 
where we've sort of seen short-term utilization shift is into telemedicine. Uh, I would guess if you know, we took a poll uh, with many of you that you've been able to use telemedicine for um, visits with your physicians since the uh, COVID-19 pandemic began. A lot of that was facilitated by the Department of Health and Human Services, and then they were subsequently followed by private insurance, uh, really allowing for that transition to telemedicine by providing reimbursement for telehealth consultations to doctors, and also some of the HIPAA high tech requirements around data security and privacy on um, telehealth platforms was relaxed. So, so you know, literally, physicians were able to use their iPhones to do telehealth consultations over FaceTime um, and have that become a reimbursable um, you know, consultation. Uh, actually, I thought this was an interesting note as well. Only about 10% of healthcare consumers that actually use telemedicine services uh, pre-pandemic. And we've really seen just because of the, the changes in reimbursement and um, you know, what has been a, a relaxing of uh, you know, privacy and security standards, uh, a lot more uh, capacity for telehealth services by not only large health systems, but you know, smaller providers as well. Um, and so what that looks like, same study, the uh, Commonwealth Fund study that was published in June, you kind of look at the, um, the line at the top, that's the one that was actually on the prior slide. Uh, if we exclude telehealth services from that line, you can see how much further um, you know, we really get a reduction in ambulatory visits. So you know, I'll, I'll scroll back up to that first slide. Um, I'll scroll back up to that first slide. Um, you know, you can really see this would have been much more impactful in um, the reduction would have been larger without having the you know, increase in telehealth services that I think was um, you know some welcome relief. And then the other piece, I guess, if we look at um, utilization changes, so we talked about what increased, what decreased. I think we also expected to see some change in prescription drug utilization. Uh, most. Um, Health care insurance companies, uh, you know, relaxed restrictions on quantity versus time edits uh, based on CDC guidance that actually allowed for early refills and for some level of stockpiling of uh, maintenance medications, just under the presumption that you know there could be an inability to receive um, prescriptions once the pandemic began in March. Uh, we really saw that stockpiling happen initially. There were, I think, a lot of 90-day fills that occurred. Um, people that also had early refills as well. But it really hasn't continued, and I think part of that is also related to just the real lack of therapeutics that are being provided to folks that have COVID-19 that are not in a hospital setting. Um, there were some reports early on, you know, there's a drug Plaquenil that um, you know, I guess it's better known as, that's the brand name, it's better known as hydroxychloroquine. Uh, that was stockpiled initially, um, much by physicians actually, and um, that has also ceased, that drug uh, has um, not been utilized nearly as much as we've sort of gotten more into um, treatment um, for COVID-19. And so what that really looked like in terms of utilization you can really see there were some uh, spikes in drug treatments initially, as I mentioned, in the first month and a half. That sort of quickly tailed off. Um, and actually now these levels have risen back up about to that baseline level. So uh, we're at a point now where we saw some real minimal early, um, or sorry, some, some increases early on in stockpiling, but some minimal decreases in sense, really a return to normal support. Uh, prescription drug utilization for the most part. So I guess as we sort of move on from the, the utilization conversation, um, the next piece is obviously the direct cost for, um, in, 
for the treatment of COVID-19. So outside of how COVID-19 has, has affected how we get other health care, which is sort of what we kind of talked through, you know, the sort of this other piece is, well, what has been the actual expense of COVID-19 and what do we expect, you know, the treatment to be? Um, the estimates from a number of different sources, Fair Health probably being the most credible, they're a company owned by uh, United Healthcare. They estimate that for a privately insured patient, the expected cost for inpatient treatment is about $38,000. And they estimated the 2020 annual cost of about $7.6 billion. There have actually been about, it was a little over 400,000 admissions, I think, at this point for COVID-19, but that includes uh, admissions for a lot of folks that are going to be covered by, you know, Medicare or Medicaid. So, the private admissions, that 200,000 dollars, that 200,000 admission estimate is um, still the you know sort of the prevailing wisdom and, and the expense overall of about 7.6 billion. Uh, also, obviously, there's been a real increase in diagnostic testing. Um, the uh, CARES Act that was passed to help uh, deal with COVID-19 throughout the country. One of the mandates in the CARES Act was that any order from a physician or a COVID-19 test had to be covered by a health plan uh, without any sort of additional um, prior authorization or other requirements uh, besides that physician order for someone that um, potentially had COVID-19. And so that's really resulted in an increase in uh, tests. Over 1 million tests have been provided in South Carolina. And uh, the average reimbursement for those tests with a private insurer is about $65. The, uh, probably the cost you would see if you, you know, walked up and were to get a PCR test uh, for you know, the active virus, that's the, the nasal swab test. Um, that cost would be more in the you know, $100 to $150 range, uh, maybe even as much as $200 retail, but the private insurance is reimbursing that test at about $65. So, Overall, sort of just kind of in summary, the changes in utilization patterns, the direct COVID-19 cost, uh, they're really affecting employer health plan expenses. And for our purposes, we're really not going to analyze, you know, if you look at this slide, the impact of um, layoffs or furloughed employees. Uh, that's what's going to be a little bit outside the scope of the model that I'm going to present in a minute, uh, just because that's so variable by employer. But if we look at the employer health plan impact, obviously uh, all those pieces that I mentioned um, have potential to increase costs, early drug refills, increase in telemedicine, more diagnostic testing, uh, treatment of COVID-19. Uh, also, there's some potential pent up demand. I, I think the impact of that pent up demand is something that we really haven't seen as much as we expected. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, as we go through a few more slides. And then certainly short term, there's obviously been a big reduction in the non-emergent services that we sort of illustrated earlier um, to the host on COVID-19. So let's, let's kind of look at this model uh, and what all those utilization changes mean financially to an employer health plan, sort of both now and, you know, we look at the future of you know, looking into 2021. And we'll do that sort of by looking at this actuarial model. Um, there are some numerical inputs in this model, but we'll kind of talk through the results in percentage terms to make sure that this is more broadly applicable. Uh, but within this uh, model, what we're looking at is an employer that has, you know, in this case, uh, cost for 2020 about $10,000 per employee per year. That's this 10,000 PPY. An expected annualized trend moving into 2021, sort of irrespective of COVID of 5%. Um, fixed costs of about 15% of that. And then uh, an employee contribution of you know, roughly 20% of that total cost. Uh, what we're not gonna look at, as I mentioned, is how this um, could be affected by layoffs, furloughs, furloughs that return to work, rehires, uh, that, that's part of this model, but it's going to be very important specific, so we're not going to look at that. Um, 
what I, what this model is going to also look at is industry and what you'll sort of see here the industry that I've indicated is all other. So this is an industry code that's going to have less impact than some other impacts or some other industries that are more specifically affected, such as you know healthcare, where there's actually interaction with potential uh, you know COVID-19 virus, and, and other industries where it's difficult to social distance and there's more close interaction, like manufacturing, retail, hospitality, and public safety sectors that just have those higher risk levels. So um, we'll also look at South Carolina, which is a location that has uh, less COVID-19 risk than some other areas of the country, despite sort of our, our trends, uh, the overall infection rates are lower than actually in certainly some other areas of the country. And also we're going to sort of exclude really large potential claims. So you'll see claims that potentially could be above $150,000 for an individual who's going to back out of this to make the results um, uh, more uh, appropriate or, or more applicable, you know, sort of on a, a general employer basis. So, so with all that said, um, I hope that wasn't too, um, too technical in terms of the explanation there, but let me just go on to the next slide and, and kind of give you a quick look. I'll just sort of jump right to what the results look like. So for this, you know, typical South Carolina employer in an industry that's not, um, or, or that's able to social distance, I should say, the impact of uh, the reduction in utilization based on a, a reduction in non-emergent care because of the COVID-19 is actually about a seven, 7.4% 7 decrease in utilization um, in 2020. And our expectation moving into 2021 is that that is going to uh, only increase about 1.5% relative to, I guess your 2021 budget expectation pre-COVID. Um, so we're anticipating that um, you know, sort of despite the reduction in preventive care, there's also potential increases in morbidity, um, delays in elective services, you know, sort of even considering all that um, and, and potential pent up demand, I should add as well. Uh, there's unlikely to be a really significant cost increase uh, based on the best you know, information we have at this point related to you know, COVID-19 costs. And I'll, I'll preface that also by saying it is a bit of a moving target. You know, I know uh, one thing that's really not known as we look at these stats is the sort of long-term impact of COVID-19. So we're looking at real direct expenses for the treatment of COVID-19, for um, diagnostic testing related to it. But, you know, there's also certainly some potential, and I think we've all read and seen different studies and different information around um, sort of vascular issues that potentially could occur long term for folks that have been infected. Um, and it's really just too early to understand what that's going to look like. So that could certainly you know, change this model. But um, for, I guess, the typical South Carolina based employer, we think actually there should be a a reduction in cost in 2020 and then in 2021, a modest uptick relative to you know, what your baseline cost would have been uh, otherwise, if that, if that makes sense. So um, a little bit more detail is sort of the aid of this waterfall graph. This will kind of give a bit more of an explanation. So really that reduction in utilization of outpatient and professional services um, is shown here and then you know you see a really modest increase in costs related to um, early drug refills diagnostic testing is just not that expensive um as i mentioned it's about a 65 dollar average refill for test um, increase in inpatient COVID 19 treatment has some expense and then some increased utilization and outcome um, for outpatient services 
just based on that pent up demand, but it doesn't offset. It certainly is a, a very small percentage relative to the reduction in duration you know, that we've seen uh, you know, thus far and uh, likely to continue in 2020. And also, I, I'd add this uh, anticipates an overall uh, infection rate for in this um, model of 3.2% based on those inputs and about 15% of the population actually or covered population being tested. So overall, this 2020-2021 um, two-year time frame, the total impact uh, is an actual reduction in costs of about 5.9% for sort of this average South Carolina employer um, that has a low risk for um, you know, COVID-19 infection. So maybe surprising to some of us to see that. And again, obviously there's some variation depending on you know, industry, location of employees, uh, and uh, you know, other, other risk factors uh, as well. Um, this just looks at sort of the same slide, but you know, if we net out employee contribution to what the overall employer cost impact would be, um, noting that you know, the contributions made by employees for their coverage would change. They would continue to pay their, I think, 20% of the cost in this model. So, you know, so here's what that looks like um, you know, in terms of utilization reductions in 2020 and then that increase moving into 2021. Also, I did want to just take a minute and also sort of talk about expectations uh, for 2021 uh, health plan renewals, especially since I think most folks that are um, participating today, I think, it, it, well, maybe it's a good mix of uh, employers that have self-funded and fully insured health plans, but, uh, you know, predominantly, you know, just based on the, the number of small businesses, most employers are going to have a fully insured health plan. And so, you know, in that case, there's um, kind of a different, I guess, uh, view you'll have on some of the same information. So fully insured uh, health plans, you're still going to see that same reduction of claims in 2020 that we talked about, especially in, you know, in those months, March, April, May, I think most of the world saw that reduction in claims. Uh, at the same time, you're likely going to receive um, for 2020, um, a return of some premium, as I think you, you may have uh, seen in the past uh, per the Affordable Care Act, a portion of premiums are returned to employers if uh, health insurer loss ratios fall below a certain threshold for large employers, it's 85%, for small employers, it's 80%. So in other words, if, if you're a, a large employer with, with more than 50 employees and your health plan uh, or, or overall, if the health insurer that, that covers your health plan pays out less than 85% of premiums and claims, the difference between 85% and the amount of claims they paid out, they actually reimburse back to um, back to the plan members. And so you're likely in, it actually be around this time of year, um, next year for 2020, to receive some level of uh, reimbursement because it's unlikely that those loss ratios are going to be met. Um, some of that is being offset. I should add, you know, I think you've seen a lot of health insurers at the same time offer 100% coverage for COVID-19 related treatment and other added benefits during the pandemic that will help to temper rebates. And it, it's important to remember as well that your 2020 experience is certainly not going to um, dictate what your 2021 uh, renewal may look like with your health carrier. So certainly there's going to be some level of uh, health insurance conservatism and expectation of pent-up demand. You know, as I mentioned, potential higher morbidity rates due to that reduction in routine care and potential costs for COVID-19 uh, long-term costs that could drive rate increases for 2021. Because as I mentioned, you know, I think I shared in that model what some of the thinking is at this point, but you know, as a health insurer, there's going to be some um, 
kind of needed, I guess, and built in conservatism to their expectation for 2021 with, with so many unknowns, despite low loss ratios in 2020. So for large employers, I would still expect some level of uh, you know, rate increase in 2021, although certainly, um, you know, as a large employer, you have the ability to uh, you know, negotiate that. And then for small employers, uh, if you're on a plan that is, um, you know, metal, metal rated, metallic, one of the small group health plans where all your premiums are based on the uh, age of your participants, those rates have already been filed and approved for 2021. So essentially, um, you know, those increases or rates are, are set at this point, despite what's going on thus far with, uh, you know, with COVID-19. So, um, a few things to think about there. And then last, before I, I wanted to wrap up, also wanted to just read quickly kind of visit the um, vaccine. Certainly we're all anticipating and hoping there's going to be a vaccine that makes it to the market. Um, I guess it was yesterday, the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca put a halt to their stage three clinical trials, unfortunately, um, due to a particular case in the UK that um, sort of mandated that their stage three trial end. Right now, there are kind of three major uh, companies who are in stage three clinical trials at a point where they could easily get to market by the end of the year. Those are uh, Moderna and Moderna, if you don't know, they're actually doing a stage three clinical trial through Vitalink research here locally. Um, and I think Vitalik may still even be taking um, volunteers if you're so interested in signing up. Um, and then uh, Pfizer, and as I mentioned, the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca. A uh, couple things I think to kind of make note of. As infection rates for COVID-19 decline, which they have been recently, stage three clinical trials actually take longer. Uh, you know, the way these vaccine trials work is they are um, double blind trials where half of the people in the trial receive the vaccine, half receive a placebo, and the trial can't end until a uh, requisite number of people in the trial actually are infected with COVID-19. And so once that number is met, then the study goes back and looks at the difference between the infection rate and the portion that received placebo versus the portion that received the actual vaccine. And there needs to be a differential between those two groups of 50%. So in other words, um, if uh, 300 people uh, are infected with uh, COVID-19 in that placebo group, there need to be less than 150 people uh, infected in the uh, group that received the vaccine in order for the vaccine to be considered effective for the FDA standard. So um, we'll see as that continues on, once we reach those benchmarks, uh, as more people uh, actually contract COVID-19, that'll determine when those vaccines are actually able to, uh, to make it to market. And potentially, as I said, um, as early as uh, this fall is, is still certainly possibility uh, based on this information, which is from uh, BioPharma and actually came out, I want to say September 1st as well. So uh, in closing, I would just say um, as an employer, kind of things to keep in mind, uh, estimate the financial impact of COVID-19. That model that I shared with you uh, is an actuarial model that you know, can be run more specific to you as an employer really look at what those expected costs are now in 2020, as well as uh, 2021. Especially if you're self-funded, collaborate with your uh, medical carrier, your, your health insurer to really understand and evaluate uh, any cost projections. They're certainly doing a similar exercise as to you know, what I'm describing with their book of business. And they do have some, uh, some helpful insight to share. 
uh, adjust your medical budget accordingly, and also IBNR your your reserves for uh, potential runout claims may need to be adjusted as well. And then continue to monitor emerging information and experience. As I said, this is um, it's not a fixed target. Things change uh, rapidly with uh, COVID nineteen, as we all see, uh, continues to dominate to um, you know dominate the news cycle and seems to be something that um, you know, we learn new things about every day. So uh, with that, I will wrap up um, and we'd certainly would be glad to answer any questions or if we want to stay on at the end, maybe you know, I'll defer to you to uh, do some questions whenever the meeting wraps up. Great, thank you, Jim. And uh, wow, that's a lot of information. Um, I, I feel smarter, although I still don't understand a lot of it. Um, but we had some really good questions. And, and so a couple of things. One, and I think you, you know, to some point um, uh, answered some elements of, of at least one of these. But the first, I mean, the nuts and bolts question, how will employee health care costs be affected next year and if I understand what you said is that um, that that model is already in place. So what's happening this year won't necessarily impact the insurance costs for next year, but it could eventually provide more of a, of a, a rebate back for the plans, depending on how much is used for care. Is that correct? Yeah, so, you know, I guess a couple things. Um, so next year, the things to think about are um, some minimal increases in utilization based on pent up demand, but you know what's going to limit the impact of pent up demand is just the funnel. Um, how much capacity is actually available for elective services in the U.S. healthcare system is not huge, and so uh, there can only be so much pent up demand that can really get into that funnel. Uh, also, um, expectations for how much, you know, quote unquote, sicker people are, the morbidity rate, how much it will increase based on less preventative care being received in 2020 as a potential driver. Best thinking right now, and then also obviously, um, you know, how much uh, direct cost there is related to COVID-19. Best thinking now is that impact's gonna be fairly minimal, maybe one to 2% for uh, South Carolina employers that aren't in an industry where there is a higher infection rate. Um, and then the other piece of that is if you're a fully insured employer, completely unrelated to 2021 experience, uh, you very likely will get a rebate based on your 2020 experience. Uh, March, April, May, those months had really low claims for almost all health insurers. And so because of that, that uh, Affordable Care Act mandated 85% loss ratio for large employers, it's going to be difficult for that to be met. And so uh, if it's not met, the difference between claim costs between 85% of premiums and, and however much is paid out, that's rebated back to employers. And that's going to be, you know, based on 2020 experience and paid out in the summer of 2021. Great. And we've got time for one more question. Um, has the impact been less in rural areas compared to the more populated areas? Has there been a difference uh, in terms of, of the COVID-19 impacts? You know, certainly in uh, case rates, you know, if you look at case rates, um, it's higher in urban areas. Uh, that's um, just based on population density. Uh, in terms of how that's being treated to um, project fully insured rates. I really don't think that's taken into consideration at this point, um, but we're really early in the looking at 2021 fully insured rates that are being you know, projected to large employers by, you know, by health insurance companies. Great, well, thank you, uh, Jim. We very much appreciate it. And, um, you know, if, if anyone has any other questions, we can certainly connect you with Jim uh, for those. Um, real quick, I am going to, uh, you know, do a couple of quick poll questions for today. And I hope uh, we have 100% on the first question. And if we don't, 
we might have some conversations about it. Um, as you know, there's only a few weeks left for the census. Um, so question number one, have you completed the census? And uh, like I said, if we're not 100%, I'll be a little bit surprised. But number two, I think is really important too. Have you forwarded the census information to anyone or shared the link on social media? Whether that's your employer, employees or um, uh, other constituents or folks you work with, you know, I think it's important to remember that all of us are kind of ambassadors of getting the word out about the census. So uh, I'm encouraged, it looks like that number is a little bit uh, higher than um, uh, 50% so far. So we'll give you another few seconds. Uh, we've got a couple more people who can vote on this um, as here, and then we'll, we'll move on um, to sharing. So I will end the poll here in a second and um, share it with everybody. And good job. We are at 100% uh, for completing the census. So uh, everybody gets a an A plus or a sticker for that one. Um, and then um, also a good um, percentage of forwarding of the census on to folks. 60% um, have and 40% haven't. If you haven't, I hope you'll consider doing so. Remember, you know, you also need to make sure that college students and um, you know, your, your college students who are not living at home and um, your, your students or your, your uh, young adults who are just out of of college and, and living on their own, you need to make sure that they have taken the census. So South Carolina is not ranking uh, as strong and uh, holistically, although I am pleased that all 10 upstate counties, I saw the update yesterday, are in the top 24 uh, in the state. Five of our counties are in the top 10, so we're doing okay. But when your state is in the middle to bottom of the country, um, you know, being at the top is not necessarily uh, good. So it's kind of like being the leading scorer on a bad basketball team. Um, we need to all be doing better. So if you haven't been sending it out, I hope you will. And uh, we'll continue, you know, over the next month, rest of the month to encourage that. So with that, Sharon, I am going to uh, turn it over to you for the county updates. Sorry. Um, first up in from Abbeville County, what some of you may not know is that there is a really, um, there are some really great robotics teams um, headed up by Charles Angel and they were headed to the national, a couple of his teams were headed to the national championships before COVID hit. Um, and so I asked him to just give us a quick little update. He is in his car. He is not driving, but he is on his way to Atlanta. So Charles, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Thank you, Sharon. Um, yeah, and I was going to make a joke about uh, driving at the same time or, or even say that, you know, my robotics teams, I'm testing out their self-driving car that they, uh, <laughs> that they put together. Uh, but in reality, we're, we're, we're driving through Atlanta right now, going to it at Alabama for a family trip. So my wife is driving. Um, but I appreciate y'all uh, having me here. Uh, as Sharon said that I'm from uh, the town of Due West, the home of Erskine College, uh, and Mama's Sweet Shop and Due West Robotics, um, which is what I'll be talking about. Dean, I wanted to let you know that uh, one of our teams is actually talking and planning right now a little census drive through um, program so that we can get more people around our area to also get their uh, census put in. Hey. Um, a little bit. Uh, background about Due West Robotics, uh, we provide STEM opportunities for youth since 2012. Uh, those opportunities include competitive robotics teams that compete in first robotics competitions. There's four different levels of competition that serve grades from kindergarten all the way through high school, so it's pretty awesome. There's over 300 teams in South Carolina. There are over 40,000 teams in the world, um, so it's pretty, pretty huge and amazing uh, uh, program. Uh, as Sharon said, uh, we've had uh, actually three of the past four state champions uh, over the last four seasons, uh, and, and they weren't, they didn't just advance to the nationals, uh, Sharon, they actually were headed to the world championship this past year. Uh, so just amazing.
amazing uh, accomplishments by the kids, you know, here from rural Abbeville uh, County. So we're real proud of them. Uh, There's a stalled vehicle ahead. A little bit of a, uh, you know, we're talking about COVID. So I was going to just give a little update on COVID. So that certainly has changed things. As I said, they were going to the world championship. That was actually canceled uh, in April. So that's definitely impacted uh, worldwide, the robotics, youth robotics uh, competitions. Uh, currently, many areas of the world are seeing less kids involved just due to COVID restrictions uh, this year, whether that's uh, within the school districts themselves or what have you. Um, I'm, I'm want to see that come up worldwide, but I'm happy to say that here in Abbeville County, we're actually staying steady and seeing an increase in interest, including students coming from to do west from Greenwood County and from Anderson County as well to be involved. Uh, so that's pretty exciting, I think. Um, we actually conduct um, some of our events and meetings virtually now, which we had never done that really in the past. Um, but I'm also happy to say that we have uh, support and we're able to uh, actually meet in person, uh, requiring masks, of course, and limiting the number of students and mentors that can be in, in a room at one time. Um, just going back a little real quick on the, uh, the success, uh, and, and I think it just promotes our, our county and our, our area you know, within 10 at the top here. Um, all of our success comes from the support within our community in Abbeville County, from Greenwood County and uh, Anderson counties. <clears throat> We've got local businesses that do fundraisers, uh, to, which includes Mama Sweet Shop, uh, need to give them a shout out, and Palmetto Blades right here in Duke West. Uh, corporations that provide sponsorships and mentors, uh, Bosch, Eaton, Stoll Industries, WCTEL, Fujifilm, just to name a few. But if it wasn't for them, there's no way that we could provide uh, these opportunities for as many kids as we do. Uh, local businesses help out with printing, uh, like commercial printing and do a sign shop. Um, and and the, the, one of the big issues that we run into is space because we have so much interest uh, where we're going to find space for our teams to meet in um, and Erskine College and the town of Duke West have definitely stepped up and, and provide some of that space so that we can meet uh, and then of course we've got our, our community members our parents uh, that help to fund and, and provide leadership and promote the program uh, even this is not even just around our area but it's, it's known worldwide uh, I've got teams from Pennsylvania, programs from New Zealand, California, and uh, Australia that actually reach out to us and they say, what's your secret sauce? How are you doing that? Uh, and one of their, their comments that's always common uh, because they follow us on social media, they know about um, the program, is that um, our community is always said to be the most supportive youth the, the most supportive community uh, for youth robotics. Uh, so I'm pretty proud to, to hear that. Our community is, is awesome with that. So that's a little that's a little update. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer those, whether it's now or, or at the end. Great, thank you, Charles. Yeah, one thing that is, is unique about the um, Do West Robotics is that they are not tied to a school as most programs are. So that's a pretty cool program there. Absolutely. Okay, next up from Cherokee County, we have Terry Dennis from the Cherokee County Meals on Wheels. Very important that um, our, some of our senior folks are, um, who are not as able to get out as they maybe were. Um, so this is a really important program. So Terry, why don't you tell us what's Thank going you. on with Cher Thank you, Sharon. Cherokee? Uh, we, uh, we have been on the front line since the very beginning. Uh, we saw our numbers increase right away especially as our local senior center had to shut down their dine-in service and everything began to close. The stay-at-home order was in place. Uh, we couldn't keep up with the referrals and the numbers of, of seniors and folks needing Meals on Wheels and who qualified for Meals on Wheels. So we just ramped up. Uh, we had a great response to our volunteer program. We had more volunteers than we knew what to do with in the beginning. Most of those folks came from our local schools, businesses that were shut down, our local YMCA. So in the beginning, you know, we had COVID response funding that we were able to apply for. So everything, we were just hitting the ground running and things really, really went well. And as we've gone on longer and longer in the pandemic, things have changed. And what has changed is uh, basically uh, something we talked about earlier is our volunteer base. Uh, a lot of our volunteers are retired folks in the community. They have not come back yet. The other folks that were really involved in the program as volunteers have gone back to work. 
um, you know, they've, they've got other obligations now with our teachers and, and other folks that have opened business back up again. So we are currently delivering Meals on Wheels Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, a frozen meal on Thursday, and then back on Friday. And we've been able to engage our older volunteers in our visitor at home program, which are phone calls, check-ins, making sure they have everything that they need, socialization, keeping everybody engaged in the community. Um, Cherokee County is a wonderful place that many of the nonprofits, we all come together, we work together to support our community and what the needs are. We actually, and Dean will be happy to know, we actually served on the census uh, board here in Cherokee County and were able to uh, assist uh, making sure that our, our most vulnerable, our seniors here in Cherokee County had their census form filled out. And we filled out probably over 75 of those forms here at our office, just talking with them on the phone, going on the internet and being able to do that for them. So we feel like everything that we do is important. We couldn't do it without the support of our community, our donors, our volunteers. The Nestle Corporation has stepped up, donated frozen meals for us to assist with our, our extra, extra meals, our emergency food program. Uh, we've sent out groceries, PPE, pet food, microwaves, fans. Um, we have found ourselves in a very unique place doing things that, that we've never done, but in a positive, great way. We look forward to the future and in hopes that um, the pandemic will end, we're gonna keep some of these best practices because it's been a great learning experience for us and very humbling. We're just glad to be able to do it. Uh, last month alone, we had over 70 referrals and um, those referrals are, are steady coming. And our senior center has not opened up their dining service yet. So things are still plugging along. All right, thank you, Terry. Um, we are going to, it, the agenda says that um, Chris Brink is up next, but he let me know that he is um, dealing with a, a member of the community and has been um, held up. So we are going to go to Troy Hanna, who is with the Spartanburg County Foundation. Um, and um, he's going to just give us an update what they're doing over there. Thank you, Sharon. Um, appreciate being included. Um, so our most recent news um, here at the Spartanburg County Foundation is uh, a year to a day, Dean, you were at the groundbreaking, a year to a day from our groundbreaking, we were able to get our permanent certificate of occupancy for the Robert Hutt Chapman III Center for Philanthropy. So we're excited to be the first center for philanthropy and South Carolina at the first community foundation in South Carolina. Uh, we were able to continue with construction all during uh, the pandemic. So our general contractor um, was so careful and was able to continue construction. We had no reported cases of COVID um, throughout the entire construction period. Uh, we um, also, we're pleased that while we were responding to the community and nonprofit needs during that time, the Center for Philanthropy was being built um, at one of the most critical times for our community, our country, and certainly the world. So uh, we feel like we have a special tie to 2020 that we'll be able to commemorate um, how we responded as a community foundation. Um, in terms of the center, the building is so important, uh, but what's most important is what is going to take place within the building. Um, and that will be around strategic operations and initiatives to support our community. And that really breaks into three pillars um, to nonprofit effectiveness, to grant making and data-driven solutions, and finally to philanthropy and action. So we've divided all of the strategic programming into these three areas. Um, and we uh, plan to introduce these initiatives over a three year strategic planning period for the Center for Philanthropy. We worked with Converge out of New Orleans um, on the strategic programming and we found that most effective. We had uh, focused our Center for Philanthropy um, idea on 13 best practices um, throughout the country and really highlighted three of those um, that you'll see presented within the center. 
but uh, currently the building is uh, prepared and ready. Um, we are placing programming. We'll have a soft move in, um, hopefully by October. Construction ended a month ahead of schedule. Um, so we are moving technology, um, data shares, um, part of our community leadership staff um, into the building and we plan for um, a grand opening, uh, possibly a virtual grand opening in first quarter of 2021. Uh, it was uh, uh, a bit refreshing when uh, someone mentioned to us, they said, this is such a great asset to have. And I know you must, must be disappointed that as a convener, you can't convene people within the space that has just been built. And we said quite the opposite. So technology has been, um, even before we had any idea of COVID, technology was a key focus um, to move us strategically into the next 75 years of philanthropy. So um, technology is a key part of the center. Um, we can convene now more than we ever have. So we could have a socially distanced panel in the gallery of philanthropy and live stream to over 5,000 people around the Southeast. So um, we've only increased our ability to convene through the use of technology. Granted, it's my hope um, that very shortly and um, leaning on every word that Jim shared with us that um, hopefully uh, there will be a resolution to this um, in, in the near future when we can convene people because it's those relationships uh, that are so important to our community success. Thank you, Troy. Yeah, we can uh, definitely relate to the, the convening virtually versus in person, which is not normally what we do here at 10 at the top. Absolutely. <laughs> um, we, it looks like Chris Brink is not going to be able to join us today, but last but certainly not least, we have Kathy Jo Lancaster with the Union County Development Board to share with us what's the, a little bit of what's going on down in Union. Uh, thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Dean, for, um, for inviting me to, to share some information today. What I'd really like to do is talk a little bit about economic activity in Union County, which seems to be mirrored uh, throughout the counties in the state. Um, the good news is, is that we are seeing an increase um, in activity and interest in our sites and our buildings. Uh, that um, really, to be quite honest, um, has not stopped a good bit. So that, that's some good news. But I would say uh, for Union County over the last 60, 60 to 90 days, we have really received a lot of interest in several of our buildings and our sites, primarily um, in the warehousing distribution uh, areas, as well as manufacturing, which, as most of you know, that is um, upstate South Carolina, you know, we are a manufacturing hub. So that, that is very, very good news. Most of um, the projects that we're seeing, not only in the county, but across the, the state are a mixed bag between existing industry expansions, as well as new locations. And we're still seeing a lot of global interest. So a lot of um, companies that are based uh, in other, other countries are still interested in locating their businesses in South Carolina and also in the United States. So that, that's some good news for us as well. Workforce wise, workers are going back to work and most of our companies are back working. Uh, some are, in fact, most of our companies are at full capacity with their workforce, but we do have some that are transitioning in. Uh, several companies also have um, actually added new product lines, which is absolutely great. I might have to give a shout out to Millican Standard Textile. They've definitely been on the national news, uh, news lately as far as um, their new lines and the, the PPE devices. And also on a smaller scale, Kemper Corporation, they're actually manufacturing masks for one of their largest customers and as well as Vapor Apparel. So we're, we're very excited that they stepped up to the plate and they answered the call as far as providing PPE out there to, to those in need. 
Um, our unemployment numbers are down. I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, we were actually one of the highest in the state at one point, and I think a lot of that was uh, reflective in that we are home to first, second, and third tier suppliers of BMW, as well as Sandra Textile, who has a very, very strong, diverse hospitality side. Uh, so those numbers have decreased. Their folks are going back to work. So we're very, very excited about that. So that's really all I have to share. I, again, I don't think that Union County um, is different than other counties in the state. I will say that on the small business end, I don't think that we had any small businesses to close their doors, which, you know, we're very, very proud of that. Um, our small business owners are uh, a foundation in our community, and we're glad that this did not impact them to the point that they had to close their doors. Um, so thanks, guys, for letting us share that information. Thank you, Kathy Jo. That's great news. Um, I, we are, that is it for today since um, Chris is not going to join us. So I'm going to throw it back to Dean to close us out. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. And, and uh, before Sharon goes, it's a bittersweet moment, but uh, we have to say goodbye to Sharon officially as a 10th to top employee. This is her last week. She is heading to bigger and better things as the manager of uh, the Hub Bookstore in Spartanburg. So uh, head over there and uh, uh, join uh, or visit her uh, there. Um, but uh, Sharon has been, we were talking about, she's been a full-time employee for about a year and a half with us, but uh, a part-time uh, uh, employee or a, a member of the team since uh, 2012. So uh, she's really been, um, you know, with, with us longer than anyone else uh, that I've had. So, um, you know, I, uh, I very much appreciate you, Sharon, and thank you for everything. And I know the folks here and then others are all appreciative of the work you've done. Unfortunately, you're not really leaving us. You're just uh, um, moving to bigger and better things, but staying as part of the community. So thank you. That's right. Thanks, Dean. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little sad that today's my last tat chat, but I'll see. Yeah, you guys come visit me in Spartanburg. Come buy a book at Hub City. Well, you can you can come back for alumni tat chat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, and we'll close up again. Thanks to all our funding partners, especially our leader, leadership level partners that you can see listed. But really, uh, we've been very fortunate as an organization uh, that we've had a great support that has allowed us to stay um, uh, able to focus on our mission throughout this time. So uh, with that, uh, our next TAT chat will be September 24th. We're working on a couple of exciting speakers that I hope to be able to announce in the next couple of days. So be on the lookout for that uh, information. Um, as I said, we're going to stick around for a few minutes for anybody who wants to stay and just chat a little bit, uh, you know, as if we were ending a meeting and we're heading out to the parking lot. So you're certainly welcome to do that. But uh, in terms of our official meeting, we are now adjourned. And I hope everybody has uh, a safe uh, and healthy weekend. Thank you. Bye. Dean, I think you need to serve snacks. <laughs> we do. Well, you know, uh, it, it's funny you say that because for our um, for our event coming up in November, we're gonna uh, we're gonna we're we're looking to do a um, uh, what is it, Justine? A, a, a snack in a or a, a party in a box or celebration something like that. Celebration in a box. What is it? Celebration, celebration in a box. Yeah, celebration in a box. So that's not a bad idea, uh, Jim. Okay, yeah, that's, that sounds fascinating. Well, that was good. I appreciated your, your comments. That's a lot of uh, information uh, there, so. Uh, yeah, as, as I went, I, I, I started thinking I probably was uh, too much into um, insurance speak, but anyway. Um, oh, that's okay. Now, I, you, you may know, did you know that Troy Hanna is also a Hampton Sydney graduate? I did not. Yeah, he graduated in 91. So okay. he, he's a, a few years older than uh, than you. But uh, yeah, he was also from Hampton, Sydney. So uh, Charles, what are you guys doing over the weekend? In 
we are uh, we're heading to Alabama to uh, visit my wife's family, who's from Louisiana. We're meeting them halfway, so to speak, and uh, it's it's her grandmother's ninety first birthday this week, this week. So, oh, that's fun! I'm glad you <laughs> guys are able to, to... Uh, get to be a part of that. Yeah, I'm glad you guys are able to to uh, go down for that. I'm sure the kids will will enjoy that. We we do a family reunion every three years, and it's always neat to see other family members absolutely absolutely and we've also got a uh, a charter fishing uh trip planned out there that my brother-in-law's got planned i don't know exactly where but that should be fun that'll be fun we've got somebody join us on the phone at the 5097 number who is that hey dean it's suzanne it finally prompted me how to unmute myself good well i'm glad i'm <laughs> glad you're here good to yeah i don't have any darn thing to say but it was a great chat it was fun are you in michigan or are you in thank, south carolina thank god no i'm in south carolina you know that is the silver lining to the pandemic they <laughs> you know everybody's remote good good well so I'm, 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 yeah i mean you've been remote part of the time for the last several years so that's pretty good yeah. that you're able to be home Yes, that that is the silver lining. Um, so yeah, plus I get to hear on a on a regular basis about a state where they're not. We, you know, there's just a lot of impact from the pandemic. Guys, I work for a company based in Michigan, and um, you know they've been through it, and they're still going through it. And uh, um, so we're blessed down here. Yeah, it's you know, I think our economy and Kathy Joe put it very well. And I'm sure, you know, everybody in, in Costas, you can talk, you know, from a small business standpoint, but uh, at least from a manufacturing uh, job standpoint, we're, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, I've heard, uh, I talked to Catherine O'Neill from Spartanburg the other day, and she said they had 45 um, companies in their pipeline, which was more than they had this time last year. So it really is, a, um, you know, there is some positive uh, we're set up in this region in a very positive way based on people's needs uh, especially around supply chain yeah yeah i mean i'm seeing a lot the the biggest thing that we, we're doing is we're just putting extra due diligence in to make sure that the numbers are make make sense and they've got the the liquidity to to carry a business through in case they do have a hard time with the business for an extended period of time yeah, I think that's, you know, I mean, you know, you have to be prepared for, for down ticks and things like, like that, certainly, but, uh, you know, it's, it's been pretty good. Um, Charles, do you know, is Abbeville County seeing the same things? I haven't talked to Stephen lately. Is Abbeville yeah, I, seeing positive? The, I don't, I haven't heard any negatives. Uh, Stephen came to our last county or our last city council meeting and he talked about some job uh, opportunities within the county so that was a good sign um and i definitely have heard more interest as far as some of our buildings that have been uh empty for for some time there's been more interest uh, in those as well uh, someone uh, earlier spoke about that a little bit i think in cherokee county um so so i i agree i think there's there's <coughs> good things happening and I think people are looking at this as an opportunity. So I hope I hope that continues. Well, I know you guys have focused around the shop local and support right. your small businesses, which I mean, we should be doing all the time, certainly. Right. But in the pandemic, it seems to me that that has that people have been taking that to heart. Have you seen yep. that? I, I have definitely in our area. Um, it, but you just never know, though. You know, I know at least for some time, and I don't think it really came to fruition, but, you know, Greenwood uh, get, had a mask ordin ordinance, and people said, well, if that's going to happen, then we're not going to, we're going to go somewhere else to go eat and, and all these kinds of things. I, I don't think that really transpired, but you just hate to hear that kind of uh, uh, a thought, you know, we need to be supportive of the communities regardless. Yeah. And especially those that, that depend on us and yeah there's no question businesses you know you know uh 
you know, this is a time that you've got to, you know, if you if you want, um, you know, local business in the good times, you got to support them in the bad times too. And you know, you know, when you're asking them for yep. uh, whether it's robotics or baseball or whatever, you know, for sponsorships, you know, you got to, you know, it's a two-sided street. And I think I think that's something we're all understanding. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that's that's important not to lose sight of because on the national economic level, it's people are in hard time. So where do you go? You go to the big box stores because things are cheaper instead of supporting the local the local small businesses. And that's where it can just create a domino effect. It's just a landslide. Once you get that ball rolling, you can't stop it. And, and so it's it's important. And w I'm seeing a, I'm seeing a little bit of a mix where I'm seeing some businesses aren't, but I think the ones that are struggling are the ones that aren't being creative enough. Because you've got to be creative. A lot of pivots, for sure. Yeah, that, yeah. I think that's a good point. So even the restaurants and, and we, we've all seen in our communities where they have the uh, curbside pickup now. You know, we never saw that due west. You know, a little bit of town uh, of a thousand, thirteen hundred people, but you know that that's what they had to do to be creative to get people to to have a quick service and. Since we don't have a drive-through or whatever, model sweet shop, for instance, or our green. So, yeah, no, I think that I think there's no question to that. And then, you know, Costas, to your point, we tried to have tried to make sure that we're, you know, uh, when we're eating, at, you know, when we're ordering food out, that we order from local restaurants, not necessarily from the the chains. Um, you know, although it's certainly important to keep those around as well. But you know you've got small uh, local uh, small business owners. I mean, you know, I, I think uh, you know, especially in communities, the bigger communities that have more restaurants in a good economy, it you know, it doesn't hurt them to have a lot. But in a in a struggling economy, I mean, when you have four restaurants, you can maybe you know, in your community, you can keep them afloat. But if you've got a hundred, it's a lot harder. So I think you're going to see um, or have seen more closings uh, in some of your larger, um, you know, Greenville, Spartanburg areas with some of the restaurants and things. Mm -hmm. 